Atma Namaste, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to our session. Let's just close our eyes, connect tongue to our palate. So we'll start off with an invocation. Inhale and exhale. Relax your body. Inhale fresh prana. Especially the oxygen that's now freely available. Inhale it deep into your core. Exhale, release all the used up energy. Any carbon dioxide. Inhale again deeply. And exhale. Inhale love. Exhale any stress, tension or worry within you. Inhale light. Exhale any darkness within you. Inhale the light and love. Exhale, spread it to your entire being. You're a being of divine light, divine love. Inhaling the light and love. Exhale, share it with your family. Smile at them. Thank them for giving you this opportunity. Inhale. Exhale, share it with everyone who's joining us today. Inhale, exhale, share it with the entire globe. Let's invoke. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chua Koksvi, to Lord Maha Guruji, Mailing, to Buddha Kwanian, Buddha Sakyamuni, Gautama Buddha, to the Lord Christ, to Yehoshua Ba Miriam, to the, to the great teachers, masters, and teachers of theosophy, to Lord Shiva, Lord Ganesha, all the angels and beings of knowledge, light, and power, to the host of angels and ministers, thank you, to our soul and divine self. We humbly invoke for your great, great blessings, for your light, for your love, for your mercy, for your guidance, all through this session, to all the angels and beings of communication, of our respective internet and Wi-Fi connection, we thank you all for helping us have a smooth, proper relay of the entire session. Thank you for helping all of us have a greater open mind to have a deeper and clearer understanding of your priceless teachings, to absorb and assimilate this knowledge and use it to become better divine instruments in your service. We thank you in full faith. Inhale and exhale, absorb the energy descending into you. We slowly open your eyes with a smile. Atma, namaste. Welcome today. We're going to now move uh, today to chapter eight. Let's see if we can finish this session today. Right, so our chapter is called The Purpose of Life. Yes, and this is where we are heading today. And so the, the entire book that we've been looking at yes considering where we are coming from and now to try and understand more while we are here as incarnated souls as the personality according to theosophy what are we to do and how are we to proceed yes and so to help us understand this one thing we have to remember is we're all part of what we call the divine scheme yes and while we are part of this divine scheme yes there is the world scheme there is the a solar scheme, there is the universal scheme. But coming down here, we need to also understand what is our role, yes, as the incarnated soul, as man in this entire scheme, right? And so when the divine outbreath, remember the, the, the breath of life that was given uh, at the initial time, the divine essence continued to go further and further down into more denser matter, into more grosser matter, did it ultimately enter the last of that downward arc, which is the mineral kingdom. And after that, somewhere there midpoint in the mineral kingdom, it started to turn and go upwards. Yes. And this is when we talk about us being uh, individualized. Yes. And this process of 
coming out of the animal kingdom and into the human kingdom is when we actually go and get ourselves our own causal body, our own higher soul. Yes, and that is the individualization, which we spoke about in the earlier sessions, if you remember, right? And uh, so to continue from there, we need to understand that in this evolution process, while we are here, there are three stages. Yes, uh, what we just spoke about right now is the downward arc, why we are coming down, yes, towards material uh, matter or physical matter in the physical world. And so as the divine spirit or the divine essence comes down, it starts to then go deeper and deeper into matter, deeper and deeper into grosser matter. And so that is the downward arc. However, we also have the upward arc. And the up upward arc is where we are trying to now move away from material, move, moving towards or going upwards towards spiritualization. Yes. And so there is a greater differentiation happening here. But the most important thing right now is to understand that we are working to go upwards. Yes. And so sometimes the downward arc is called involution and going up is called evolution. Now, if you look at the second point, it also mentions the first part is where spirit is coming into matter. But at this point, the spirit is now learning how to dominate matter. Right. And so the vehicles that we all have is part of this matter, which is trying to go down, but we are trying to go up. So we're trying to also have greater uh, control over these vehicles and not allow it to do what it wants while we are trying to evolve, yeah? And uh, towards the end, uh, you have the, the higher part of this arc, uh, that is when you and I tend to individualize, right? Uh, when we differentiate ourselves and we become human and not just uh, ordinary human, but we want to become what is called a developed man or a spiritual man, right? And so as we work towards uh, gaining more and more spiritual knowledge and practicing this, we're hoping that at some point we will unite with our higher soul and slowly in this process, a lot of latent powers in us start to get awakened so that we can become better instruments for the great solar being, yes, for the deity. So that is basically the three stages that I'd like you to remember as we go forward, yeah? Now from this point where I would take you is something we already know, so I, I've put this really uh, quickly here. So evolution for us from the point where we uh, come from and going back is basically where from the monad, a certain portion, right? Only a small fragment of the monad comes down as the ego, which we call the higher soul. So from the divine spark, a small portion or a fragment comes down as the higher soul and a smaller fragment of this higher soul then comes down as the incarnated soul, right? This is what we know from master's uh, courses. And so this is something you already know. Now to move further, so the view of life, right? As you and I know. So one is for the simple man, he understands then at this point of evolution that he is actually only the incarnated soul. And since he understands himself to be only the incarnated soul, then he tends to think that life is very, very, he thinks that life is just this one lifetime. And therefore he starts to recognize that uh, life is for, for him alone. Yes, that's the only thing that he has. And then he tries to regulate his whole activity around that one life. Now, one of the things that he tends to do uh, every time he's in a situation is to try and look at how will this particular situation bring about profit or give something to him. And so the incarnated soul is constantly stuck with himself, what he wants, what he needs, what he requires. However, as man starts to become uh, more intelligent and starts to understand that there's more to life, starts to go onto the spiritual path, then he realizes that his life, which he calls his incarnated uh, life, is only part of one day of that higher soul. And so instead of asking, what is going to happen with this situation for me alone? He says, no, what is going to happen in this situation that will benefit my higher soul, right? And so the situation of 
the person who's living on this earth, the incarnated soul, it varies as to where he is at this point of development. So an ordinary person, and so you'll find people even around you, even today, they're more worried as to, okay, how, what am I going to get here, right? Uh, is this going to benefit me? Yes, can I get more out of this? Can I bargain and get this? And so there are going to be people around you who are still in this ordinary state of life. And it is fine. There, there is nothing wrong with them. They are just starting their journey. They will get to where you are. Now, hopefully you and I are at a point where we started to realize, hey, you know what? I'm not just this body. I'm not just the incarnated soul, but I'm actually the higher soul. And so whatever I do should then benefit my higher soul. And if it benefits my higher soul, then my process of uniting with my higher soul is, at, is, is closer than before, right? And uh, so that is one thing to remember. <clears throat> so by asking these questions that I've put to, on a regular basis, you and I will try and figure out what exactly are we doing, right? And so that's why I put these questions. So if you start to look at your life today, have you changed from always looking at yourself and getting profit only, only for yourself? Or do you actually starting to see, okay, if I do this, will it actually benefit my higher soul? Yes. Is this actually something that I want to do and how I want to progress? And so in the process of understanding that you and I are beyond um, the self, slowly this realized soul will start to forget the self. So the process is as you start to evolve, you start to forget about who you really are. And then you start to work and you try to see what is it that you and I can do that will actually benefit others. Others are not just family members, are not just friends, not just your community, but it grows much wider. For example, at this point, when we try to do our meditation on Twin Hearts or we do the Great Invocation, it's for the entire globe, for the whole of humanity. Yes. And so a more realized person would realize what I need to do is going to go outside of me, outside the self, outside of what I want towards others. And others is not just a small circle but it's the whole globe, the whole of humanity. And so you start working towards trying to find out how you and I can then work towards getting this, um, uh, getting our actions, our thoughts and our, our feelings towards others, outward rather than inward. Yeah. So the question is, ma'am, doing twin hearts and soul meditation would reduce our incarnations. Also, can we have direct contact to the intuitive plane through these meditation? When you do the twin hearts meditation, basically the crown chakra is the one that is connected to the intuitive world, right? And doing only meditations is not going to reduce the number of incarnations. The number of incarnations depends on how you have evolved as a person. Right. And so that means when we're talking about evolution is your purification, working towards higher thoughts, higher emotions, so that when you go there, you don't have that many impurities. And at the same time, you take care of what we spoke about yesterday, the law of cause and effect or the law of karma. Yes. And so coming back to what we're talking about. So you want to try and see to it that you are starting to then move out of yourself. It doesn't mean that you don't take care of yourself. Yes, you need to take care of yourself. But however, the, the focus is to try and help humanity. Now, not just humanity, but to also see how is my action, what I plan to do in accordance with the plan of God or the solar deity or uh, the supreme being. Yes. And so that's another thing that we need to try and remember. So let me move to the next one. So one is as you start to to evolve and grow, your learnings would be, one is to forget about yourself, yes? Um, in the sense that your concentration of your entire life cannot be only about who you are, right? It has to go beyond that. It has to work towards others and basically going to a larger, larger community, ultimately being the, hum uh, the whole of humanity. And then in accordance with the plan of the supreme being, if I could put it that way here, yes? Or the plan of your teacher. Now, uh, in this process, we have to remember that we will create thoughts and emotions, yes, and a whole variety of thoughts and emotions. And so these thoughts and emotions lie in what you and I call the virtues. 
Yes. So we have virtues and we have vices. And so some of the virtues are mentioned here, love, sympathy, reverence, uh, benevolence. But if you look at your vices, there's hatred, there's jealousy, there's envy, there's pride, there's cruelty, there's fear. And you want to overcome your vices as much as possible and work towards developing the virtues in reference to those vices. Yes. And one of the ways to do that is to forget about self and focus on others. And so this is one thing to remember as we recognize that the thoughts that we have, the actions that we have are not only towards self, but have slowly started to go beyond that towards others. Yes. And so the, the, the point here is for us to go beyond ourselves. Now to do this, you've got to remember that it's only through knowledge. Yes. And so you can see it right here, written here. It's only through knowledge that this ignorance that we have is then dispelled. Yes. So knowledge or light will dispel the darkness around us. Now you've got to remember the qualities that we have, the, the books calls it evil qualities. I will just call it uh, negative qualities. So any negative quality that you have that has grown in us, You've got to remember, we've been here for a very, very, very long time. Yes. And so in the process of coming here and then, you know, as you start to come into the human kingdom, the, the, the natural tendency of most people is that because of the kind of things people do, which is all self-oriented, is very selfish to a large extent. And so the tendency to then only look for themselves and, and figure out what can I do for myself is something that everyone is doing. And man as such is someone who imitates. And so if you see everyone doing that, you say, oh, maybe you and I should do that, right? And so in the initial times, I'm talking about early part of our evolution in the human race, we have been selfish to a large, large extent. Yes, and so though we know today it's wrong, but in those days to probably be selfish was probably okay. And there are a few who then realize maybe it's not so good to be uh, selfish and then become unselfish and then slowly work towards a virtue. So don't beat yourself up even today because you and I all have weaknesses. We all have what is called negative qualities in us. And so this has been with us for a very, very, very long time. However, today, the knowledge has now been given to you. The light has been now shed upon you. And so from now or henceforth, you need to then use that light to work towards turning your vices into virtues. Yes. And so the method lies right in front of us. Master Choa has given us enough tools to try and figure out how to overcome a vice into a virtue. Now, uh, we all know this, but I've just mentioned it, that, that for every vice we have, there is a contrary virtue. Yes. So if you look at a list, I think I have a list here. Let me just see. Yeah, so I've put a, a couple of things that I've mentioned in the book here. So if you look at the virtues and the vices, so like I said, many of us would have these vices which we have developed uh, for a very, very long time. Yes, and so these vices that we have, you're talking about maybe 2,000 years of developing these kind of vices. And so you can't expect in this lifetime and in the next lifetime to completely purify yourself. It's not possible. Because something that you have taken, say, uh, 2,000 or 25,000 years uh, to develop is not going to go away in one or two incarnations. And so we have to remember that this might take maybe another 100 incarnations for us to completely purify ourselves. Yes. And so you don't, you don't start to look at your life. Uh, you don't start to put yourself down because you realize you have so many weaknesses or limitations. It is okay to have weaknesses and limitations. It's part of how you and I grow. Yes. And so one of the things to remember is don't try to focus on trying to pull out all your weaknesses at this time completely and fully. It's not possible because we have, remember we were talking about that mental body and then the way we start thinking, the way we start doing things creates like a hard, uh, you remember we called it a what? It creates like a what? Now for that to get disintegrated, so it's going to take a while. So you're talking about like an onion, which has like 2000 layers, right? And taking off each layer is not going to happen in one or two lifetimes. It will take time. Yes. So there's nothing wrong with you and I. Uh, it, it, 
it will take time to overcome these limitations and weaknesses. Yes. But the point is, once you understand there is a method that you can use to try and work on it, when we don't use that, that is when, though the light has been shed on us, we don't use it. And this happens to people. A lot of people uh, do realize, you know what? Yes, I have a weakness and they may, might even do the course and realize, hey, this is a good method to overcome my limitation. But then they say, oh my God, it's too much work. For us who do blue triangle, it's like, oh my God, 10 minutes of blue triangle, um, in a reflection, another 10 minutes, 20 minutes, it's okay, it doesn't matter. I'll just watch my TV, right? It's too much effort for, for a lot of uh, uh, younger souls. And so the ones who are determined will then push through. So let's just go back to um, that image again, and then I'll continue. So this is something most of you already know, uh, whether you're in the school or not. So there is, for example, selfishness. And you want to overcome the selfishness and work towards becoming unselfish. So like I said, the tendency to have, you know, uh, take an advantage uh, and have the advantage for self or pleasure for the self, it has been there with us for a very, very long time. We've been carrying it for a while. And so don't beat yourself up if you still feel that at moments you are still selfish. It's okay, right? Uh, so they say there's a long history of selfishness. Most of us are yet far from becoming persons who are going to go completely 100% into altruistic attitudes or actions. So don't beat yourself. Just realize I'm working towards it. I'm becoming better and better and better. Right. And so this is also basically what you call um, the, the principle or the law of cause and effect, right, which we have created for a very, very long time. And now it's going to come back to us. And and in the process, we realize, hey, you know what, I need to get out of this. And many of you already started working uh, to come out of this. So these uh, evil qualities or these negative qualities within us have grown slowly um, for a very, very long time because of ignorance, because of lack of understanding. And hopefully today with what we are going to talk about, it will help you then work towards uh, moving the vice into uh, virtue. Yes. Now, uh, what we need to then work is to try and then develop the opposite habit of the wise, which is a virtue. So suspicious people, you know, where they find anybody who's walking, anything, any situation, they always see the negative, right? Oh, that person must be here because he wants to do that, or he's going to get this out of me, or she's doing this because she wants that. There is no trust in people around. And so once they start to realize, hey, you know what, uh, there is there is something called trust and I can, this person is trustworthy. Maybe it's a child that you have. Uh, you start to develop maybe small percentages of trust with one person, two, and then it starts to increase, right? Uh, so the others, um, avarice and generosity, being, being someone who, instead of only keeping it for self, starts to say, okay, fine, I'm going to share and distribute and give to others as well. Being irritable, uh, something very common even today, and so you want to learn to become calm because when you're irritable, your solar plexus is the one that is going crazy. Yes, all those emotions. And because of which uh, you cannot then think clearly, you can't even feel clearly because your emotions are all in the lower level of the solar plexus, not the higher. And so once you start to calm down, one of the ways is your breathing. You calm down, your energy calms down. And then hopefully with the Agni Chakra, you can think better. Depression, where you start thinking the whole world is horrible, no one loves me, you know, nothing is good for me, nothing is going my way, blah, blah, blah. The, one of the ways to do that, I remember Master Cho would say, if a person is miserable in life, and, and that's one of the situations where people are depressed, he says, ask them to go out and help others, right? Because when they go out to help others, they start to recognize that people out there have lives that are worse than theirs. And, and what what they're going through is very, very difficult. And so if they can then understand that this life that uh, he or she has can then make their lives uh, better, right? Uh, or rather they compare their lives and they realize their life is much better. They start to enjoy their life. Yes, the happiness and peace starts to come in. And uh, so here, the old word uh, used here is cheerfulness. But that is important as you also evolve, not just here. Right, and critical. Uh, critical, not just verbally, but I think our, our uh, difficulty is in mental criticism. It is very easy to avoid doing something harmful through our words or in our actions. But in our mind, 
it's very difficult because uh, most of us don't have a break on our thoughts. It's very difficult to, to say, okay, I need to stop thinking like this about someone, about, about a situation. Uh, the breaks on that is the toughest. And so Master Cho says that's the most difficult for all of us to work through, but it's possible. And one of the ways to do that is to start looking at the good in everyone. Yes. So whether it's your <clears throat> office person, whether it's someone at the house who helps you, whether it's your sibling, whether it's your spouse, your child, to start to also see the good in them. So when you see the good in them, and yes, areas that they need to improve, you see them as a whole. Most of us don't see people as a whole. We only see that one side because we are blinded by um, the, the negative or whatever, the critical side of us. And that does become an issue for most people. Yes. And uh, so one of the things that we need to remember is that when we have these negative qualities in us, in us, the incarnated soul, which actually means there is a lack of the corresponding virtue in our higher soul. So if we have that vice right now, we can be sure that our higher soul does not have that particular virtue. Because if the higher soul had that virtue, regardless of when we come and which lifetime, it will influence every lifetime after that if we have developed that particular virtue. So say, for example, you have actually developed the virtue of generosity. And so every lifetime that you come, because that is already a virtue, it's inbuilt in you. So when you come down as an incarnated soul, you will be generous. That will already be a part of who you are and you will continue to be. Yes. Um, so uh, to come back to what we are saying, when we look at what I'm referring to, let me just go back. Yes. And so you have these, uh, we have these virtues and these vices that you and I are going through. Please don't beat yourself about it. But one of the things that we need to remember is if you look at this part, if these vices are there in you, this, ten, this uh, virtue is, is absent in your higher soul. But if these virtues are present in your higher soul, it will then be present in all your lifetimes. Yes. So the point is to develop the virtues so the higher soul can then use those amazing qualities that we have into every lifetime, any time and every time we come, right? So the negative quality in the incarnated soul is basically the lack of corresponding good, or I would say the virtue in the higher soul. Yes, once that good quality is acquired by the higher soul, then it becomes part of all your future lifetimes. Yes, I hope that's interesting. Now, uh, let me just get back. There's a question here. Now, if, uh, say, for example, you have a partner outside of your marriage, right? When you have a, when you have a relationship outside of your marriage, then you are breaking that uh, sacred contract that you have with this other person, yeah, your spouse. And to break it would, would also mean that you are going against the first virtue uh, that we have in, uh, in Haratic Yoga, which is loving kindness, loving kindness to your spouse. So why and what makes the person go out? We spoke about it in, in a previous uh, session. However, the point is when you do that, are you causing harm to your present spouse in your present relationship? Right? So sometimes you want to do it for yourself because you need to feel love or whatever outside because there isn't any in. But in doing that, are you also causing harm? So there's a lot more when it comes to, like I said, relationships and affairs. It's, it's a little complex and I, and I think it takes a longer time than just a few minutes to explain that. I hope it will help. Right. Uh, so things that happen in, in marriages, in, in relationship is also got to do with the previous one. So you need to figure out. Let me just give you one thing. I remember uh, Master Cho said, uh, you know, when I used to teach virtues, people would ask me, uh, they would say, you know what, uh, what if we have like one or two boyfriends? And so I said, listen, as long as you're comfortable, there's nothing wrong. The higher beings don't have an issue if you want to. And it's an open relationship. But however, when it comes to a marriage, when, when there are people who are already together, if you get involved as a third person, my point is, even if this person that you love so much leaves that spouse and comes to you, right? 
how can you be sure that this person will not leave you to go to another person? That was the only thing, you know, for me based on law of karma. And Master Cho added and he said, how can you be so sure that the person that you love outside of your marriage is not an enemy from a previous lifetime who's come here now to break your marriage? And I was like, oh, okay, I never thought of it that way. Yes. So there are many aspects to it. And, and so I'm just explaining these two for you. Yes. Um, could it be possible that the virtues could be more prominent in a person and the person later becomes more balanced? Um, the virtues could be prominent at this point, uh, possible. Uh, but what do you mean by balance? I don't understand. So if the person already has virtues, they're already developing and becoming better. Uh, but if you mean that as they evolve, they start to balance all other virtues, that definitely is supposed to happen. So as you evolve more and more, you need to develop yourself and balance yourself. That is very, very important. Yeah. Is it possible for the virtue to go away? No. Like I just said here, uh, it goes back to your higher soul. So it's always going to be with you. But because of circumstances, maybe a wise, uh, because you've given it more energy, might become stronger for a time period. But the natural uh, integrated part of you as the incarnated soul, having those qualities will still remain with you. Yeah. Uh, so. Um... <laughs> uh, OK, so the example about the relationship, one is if, if you go into a person, uh, if you are the person outside of the marriage of a couple, when you do get one person uh, to come out of the marriage, the one that you love, and you get married, how can you be sure this person is not going to leave you and get married to someone else? Because it's like this, what you do to someone will come back to you. So if you, I mean, I'm not saying you've stolen the, the spouse, but if that marriage has broken and the person has come to you, the law says if you have broken a marriage and, and the person has come to you, you will, you will also have a broken marriage and the person will go out of the relationship. Yeah, the spouse or the partner. And so uh, the other thing that Master Cho mentioned is, how can you be so sure that the person that you are so much in love with outside of your marriage, yes, that's an extramarital affair, is not a person from a previous lifetime, an enemy from a previous lifetime, who's here now to break your marriage. I hope you get that this time. Okay, so let me move on. And so to continue with what we're talking about, uh, we were already at 7.5. Okay, let's go here. Yeah, so hopefully you understood this part. And so for me to move on. So one of the things that you want to acquire as you start to evolve is to remember, yes, if we do have a negative quality, the negative quality is just finite. It's just that much of anger that you have or only that much of fear that you can have. That, that is, it's definite, yes. However, the... The ability of willpower that you have to overcome this particular vice that you have is infinite. Do you understand what I'm saying? So even though you have anger or, or say uh, fear, it's only this much, but the willpower you have to overcome this anger or this fear is infinite. And you can work on this anger or this fear every day, every month, every year, and every incarnation for years and years and years together. So obviously, as you work on it every year, every lifetime, it's going to become smaller and smaller and smaller. And in the end, there's nothing left. It is out with its root outside you, the incarnated soul. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So you might have a vice and the vice has, yes, this, this much only. It can't have more. I'm talking about whatever you brought from the past. Yeah. Now, is, this is all that you have. And what you have is your willpower, which is infinite. You can continue to use your willpower over and over and over and over again. And so as you remove layers and layers and layers of this anger, it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller till it becomes so small that in the end, with its root, it's out of, your, out of you, the incarnated soul. Right? So please remember that you have a lot more power than that vice. You are stronger and more powerful than the vice. That is one thing that you need to remember and realize that you need this and you, you can use it at any point. The next is the clarity of thought. Now, remember the thought 
that you and I have, if we cannot think clearly, it's very difficult for you and I as evolved or developed beings to continue to pursue further on our path, on our spiritual path. So clarity of thought is very, very important. So whatever it is that you're trying to understand, whatever it is that you are trying to create, you need to be clear about what it is that you want to achieve, what is it that you want to build, how you want to plan it. You need to try and develop more and more on clarity of thought. The second is, you need to be very clear about anything and everything that you want to do. You can't be vague, yes? Um, it, it can't be something that, that you say, oh, you know, something like this. No, if you are working on developing yourself and working towards becoming an evolved spiritual being, you have to have clarity, not just in thought, but in anything and everything that you do, you need to be clear. And uh, which I mentioned earlier, you need to also develop cheerfulness and being calm, yes? Now, why are we talking about these? Because this is something that we require as we start to evolve, yes? And so the ego must create the virtue and to create the virtue we need to realize that the vice is not so strong but if you give it a lot of energy it feels like it's stronger than us but remember you and i have infinite you know it it is it will never get exhausted of willpower that we can use over and over and over again yes just like we use pressure you can use this pressure over and over again to to kind of weed out this uh, vice within us yes and so uh we need to then attempt to uproot this negative habit within us. And we will, we will find this difficult because it's a, it is hard work and it will require you to do it over and over and over again. Yes. And so as you can see in the last one, you need to keep building on yourself. And so this is what Master Cho talks about muscles, correct? And so he says, uh, when you go to the gym and you work out with, with weights, after some time, Yes, maybe a couple of hours, you'll notice that this part of the body starts to hurt. But you don't get annoyed with the weights and go and kick it and say, how can you cause this, right? And so Master Chua says, the effort that we need to put to overcome this vice will be painful, right? But he says, you need to constantly keep putting this pressure, use your willpower to put the pressure to then slowly, 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 slowly dig that entire vice out of your system. And so he says, it is like you developing muscles with the physical body. Now, the same thing also applies uh, when we're talking about uh, muscles. There are people who, you know, are happy with a flabby, you know, it's, it's full of fat and they think, oh yeah, you know what, I'm not bad. <laughs> I've developed enough. I seem to look good. But actually, when a person looks at you, they realize you're not yet developed. So sometimes people think that their flabby muscles are good enough to be considered as being fully developed. And there are others who find that this whole process of, you know, working on themselves constantly over and over and over again is too tedious and then they, they kind of just leave it. Yes. So two things to remember, regular exercise. Yes. I'm not talking about physical exercise. We're talking about uh, mental exercise, regular exercise of the right kind of will develop certain muscles in us and regular mental exercise of the right kind will develop the missing quality in us. Yes. And so those, character, those characteristics have to slowly now get in us. And so let me just move to the next slide. And so with character building, you have to then exercise regularly, working on overcoming uh, your vices through mental and physical effort. Constantly pushing yourself to say, hey, you know what, I need to do this. And another thing that we need to do is... Um, most of this can only happen if we increase our knowledge and understand the truth. And so one of the things that we're doing today is to try and develop that knowledge so we can understand the truth behind how you and I can start to develop. Now, one of the things, is to, one of the things that we need to do is the third point is to develop the self, the incarnated soul, developing more strength and more positive qualities. It's going to take a lot more effort, but we need to work towards helping this incarnate soul develop greater inner strength and more positive qualities. Because until and unless we reform ourselves, we can't go out there and tell the world, hey, you need to do this. They say, hello, you practice first, then you talk to me, right? But if they know that you are already practicing these virtues, then it's easy to go out there and talk about virtues. Uh, the last part here that I'd like to talk about is your thoughts. 
you and I know that our thoughts are super powerful, super powerful tools. Yes. And so even I um, do have trouble with this because it's so easy for these thoughts to just come out of the mind about someone or sometimes even words saying, you know, you are silly or stupid or how could you do this? And, you know, don't you understand? And so the way we talk and the way we create thoughts do affect others. However, when we work on ourselves and we realize, hey, even we have weaknesses and limitations. When you see the other person, you realize, hey, you know what? That person also can make mistakes. That person also goes through difficult times. And so you realize you will use your thought then just like you learn to use other things around you. You then learn to use this amazing, powerful tool, which is called your thought positively, both for yourself and others. Yes. And I think this is where I really love Master Chua's teaching, where he has already put all this into our spiritual practice. Yes. So inner reflection firm resolution is basically this. So you go back every day and you reflect on the whole day to see, okay, fine. How was I thinking today? How was I talking today? How was I acting today? Was it okay? Yes. Was I practicing virtues or was I, was I practicing vices? If I have, then let's just use the screen technique and erase it. Work on developing positive thoughts. So remember the good image that we talk about is actually a positive thought. A strong positive thought that you create for yourself so that this thought becomes so powerful one day that it actually becomes you. Yes. And also helps you overcome this vice that you've been carrying on for incarnations and incarnations. Yes. And so uh, a wise man will watch his thoughts with the greatest of care. Yes. And he realizes his duty is to govern those thoughts and to develop this huge, um, powerful tool, the thought power for positive things. Yeah. So let me just talk about thoughts and actions again. Uh, thus eliminating from himself all negative and unfolding in all negative qualities and unfolding himself good qualities. The man ultimately presents himself Yes, raised above his fellow men. That's where you and I want to go. You and I want to go to a point where uh, you have actually developed enough to then be seen as one of those who've, who've superseded his fellow brothers and sisters. And why are we talking about this? What and what will this actually do for us? Yes, coming to almost the end, hopefully, of this chapter. And then I'll go to your questions. Yes. So why, we, why do we want to then evolve to raise ourselves above our fellow brothers and sisters? Is because the members in the hierarchy, the ones who are in charge of this evolution, are actually looking for souls like you and me to train you. Yes. And so they're actually trying to get you and I to then become what is called apprentices on the path of spiritual growth. And so... Once they see you, they notice you because of what you have done for yourself, how you've worked for yourself. They look for you to train you to become instruments in doing their work, right? That is, they're, they're basically looking at the evolution of our, our, our race. And then when you start to become good, right, in the sense that you have started to develop more and more virtues, you become strong as a person, you are wise, you understand things, you've started to sacrifice everything about self and you are out there to help another person, they realize this instrument is ready. This soul is ready to be used. And so they take you on as an apprentice. And then the ultimate goal here is actually to become part of the brotherhood. Yeah. The great white brotherhood. And so just to give you a bit more understanding. So it's the masters of wisdom. Yes. They call the masters of wisdom. When they find that you have started to become good and better and wise, and you've started to unfold your latent potentials. Once they notice that this person has done that and is no longer uh, self-centered, uh, but actually is able to then come out and help others, they will then take you as an apprentice on probation. And the probation, according to the book, says it's about seven years. Yes. Now, it could be longer, it could be shorter. But the point is, you are now on a different path. Yes. And if in this process of probation, they are satisfied with what you've done, that is satisfactory enough, you become what is called a pupil. 
a pupil and you come under the guidance of a particular master and that master obviously you get closer to the master and you become what is called the son of that master yes and and this is a very important uh, part and <clears throat> the rest of it i'd like to use the book to explain a little bit more so as you work towards becoming good yes and you not only become good but you also start to <clears throat> uh, work on becoming wise and strong <clears throat> the positive qualities in you are then noticed by them and they definitely want you uh, on board yes <clears throat> this honor that you're talking about trying to become an apprentice is so great that no ordinary person who's just good will suffice yes just being good is not good enough you must be like i said wise and strong uh, to have been able to then open out the latent or develop the latent qualities within you. So must live no longer with self or uh, being selfish, but is an intelligent, uh, intelligent soul who's aware of the connection with the higher soul. And then you become a great part uh, or you become a part of the great scheme of this entire universe. It's not just a solar system. You start to understand a bigger scheme. So they say one of the things that you need to do when you want to get here, he must be willing to sacrifice everything and himself first, first of all, and for the sake of the work that has to be done. Yes. And so sacrifice on your part is very crucial as you want to evolve. It says he must make himself something more than man. That is his ordinary brothers and sisters. He has to be radiant, rejoicing, strong, and must live for the sake of others and expressing the love of God in all that he does. Yes. When a man has succeeded in unfolding his latent possibilities, I've written uh, latent potentials, the master of wisdom receive him as an apprentice on probation. Probation is usually seven years. Once the work is satisfactory, this person is uh, what they commonly call a pupil now uh, having a greater relationship with the teacher learning to see things the way the teacher does yes and proves to him proves to him to the teacher that he is worthy of becoming what is called the son of the teacher now these three stages mark the relationship of his own master sorry these three stages mark his relationship to his own master not to the brotherhood as a whole Yes, so all that we're talking about is just to that master who's going to guide and help him, right? The brotherhood admits a man of its rank only when he has fitted himself to pass what is called the first great initiation. And so let me just look through this with you before I end my session for today. So when you look at uh, this first initiation, this is what we're talking about. This entry into brotherhood of those who rule the world may be sought out as the third of the great critical points in the man's evolution yes and so we're going to look at these three right now and so what is the first one the first of these is when man has individualized out of the animal kingdom and then obtained himself a causal body right so that is already moving towards the first initiation so you're already taken on a, a higher soul you're out of the animal kingdom the second uh, is that when man realizes the great facts of life, yes, turns away from being selfish and then works towards intentionally towards the evolution and working towards and aligning himself to the will of God. And the third point is ensures himself against possibility of failure to fulfill the divine purpose in the time appointed to him. Yes. And so, uh, yes, you've come out, you've got your higher soul, but right now you need to overcome whatever limitation you have and then f figure out whether your focus, your will is now focused with the will of God, working towards manifesting divine, the divine plan. And then you will, the brotherhood will see that whatever you're doing, you will not face failure because failure is not part of the plan of uh, the higher beings, yes? But to fulfill whatever it is that you are supposed to do in this lifetime. And then you've come here to do this. And for those who have reached this point, 
Yes, that is the first initiation have made themselves absolutely certain of reaching a further point also. Now, ultimately, when you go through all these so-called initiations, where do you want to head? You want to become what is called an adept. Yes, and that is the ultimate goal of this. When you reach the, uh, when you reach the level of adeptship, you are considered what is called a superhuman. Yes, the man who has become an adept has fulfilled the divine plan. And so when I reflect back on Master Cho's life here, I realized uh, for him, you know, a lot of things that we were doing we were always very slow because I understand now that the purpose for which he's here, remember they said these people have their own divine plan or part of the divine plan they have to uh, manifest. And it also mentions here, it says here, um, to fulfill the divine purpose in the time appointed for it. And so Master Cho had only that much time to fulfill his destiny here, to fulfill his divine plan with us. And so for him, day in and day out, he had to work on himself. And so all the things that we spoke about, if you look at it and reflect on, uh, if you have heard of Master Chua, right? And when you look back at these, you will realize that uh, Master Chua had probably all these, yes? Uh, all these things that we're talking about, uh, working on regularly improving himself, knowledge, the amount of knowledge he was able to impart to us, uh, giving us the truth about who we really are. Uh, we've seen him develop qualities and strength uh, in the years that we have worked with him. And he has worked on, him, worked on himself enough to then be a great instrument to try and help change the world. Yes or no? Right. And everything that he's taught us, uh, definitely with reference to thought, he's told us that is the most difficult part uh, to overcome. But to then once you recognize that this is an amazing tool, you can use it to make your lives better. Yes. And so uh, let me just continue with this. Sorry. Yes, let me just end this uh, because I need to end this right now. Yes, and so you have um, the various in initiations. Maybe tomorrow I will talk about that a little bit more. Otherwise, it becomes too much. So po the point is when you are uh, what you call first initiate, right? Now, these are just terms. Don't worry about it. But as soon as you come onto the probationary path, yes, when you are uh, a first initiate, that is like you entering, say, um, college. Yes, you're just in the first level of college. And an adept is someone who has uh, successfully completed the entire curriculum of his studies and moved out, right? So just, just to make it very, very simple. So uh, a first initiate is someone who's just entered into this whole uh, university that they want to learn and grow. An adept is already finished with it. So an adept doesn't have to come back anymore. Yes, he, has, he or she has already reached the goal that it, that she or he has to, and then they can go further upwards, right? But some of them do decide to come back to try and teach us more. Yes, and so um, that is more or less the end of the first chapter. And so let me just go back to some of the questions here before I end my session for today. Okay, you did a register marriage and then the marriage was broken after a week. Uh, what could be the learning in this case, right? Uh, so working towards, you know, getting uh, two people together and then uh, for it to go almost to that point, including register and then the woman uh, falling out basically means that you have done this to someone in a previous lifetime. Of course, there wouldn't have been a register at that time but you had already taken the marriage all the way till probably right at the point where uh, it needed to get culminate and then you walked out. And so right now it happens to you for you to realize how it is like to be left behind when everything was going smoothly towards that particular point. Yeah. So that would be one thing. Now to have a successful marriage, one of the things that you can do is um, at least the uh, MCK's Food for Hungary Foundation Karnataka actually contributes uh, to mass marriages in, in different parts of uh, Karnataka because there are a lot of poor people who can't afford a proper marriage. And so when you then help someone else get married and, and that marriage actually culminates in proper marriages, maybe that would be one way of doing it. Another is if you want happiness in your life and that's what you hope marriage would bring to your life, uh, also donate to orphanages. When you bring, those, bring happiness to those children there, a happiness will enter into your life.
sometimes um, follow the virtue, but other person doesn't. Does that mean the lesson of patience? Okay. So if you are following a virtue, remember that you might be evolved slightly higher than this person. He or she is still struggling. Remember, there are people who, who listen, who say, yeah, you know what you're saying makes sense, but too much effort for them to work on themselves. And so they might still be here, but you have putting, are you are putting regular effort, working on your muscles to develop and become better. And so you can't compare yourself to the other person. And so, yes, just like teachers have patience with uh, young students, you and I have to have patience with young souls around us. Yeah, sometimes not very young, uh, sometimes just young enough to bother us. <laughs> yes. Um, Sorry, I'm not too sure, Manisha, what you mean, or we can even come out also, right? Uh, mentally retarded child, uh, yesterday's discussion, can we take child healing as he has to work his karma? Can we take healing? I'm not too sure, um, Shonal, what you really mean. Uh, you say you want to take on the healing of mentally challenged child. Yes, you can. There's nothing wrong. You're only going to help them. However, remember, uh, with a mentally challenged child, the problem is not just with them. There's a lot of uh, stress and uh, anxiety, irritation from the parents. And remember, all of us are connected, right? And so that connection that we have, the energy within the parents affect that child, even if they are okay. So even after your healing, you need to first shield the child. Uh, in some cases, you need to also start healing the parents of mentally challenged children. Yeah, it's not easy. It's not an easy life. Uh, the marriages we are doing are our soulmates only. You mean uh, the person you married, is he your soulmate? Not necessarily. Soulmates don't have to always be only your spouse. Uh, it could be a parent. It could be a sibling. It could be a friend. It could be your child. Uh, the, the point is the connection between the two souls. Uh, it, it's, it's so amazing that it feels like you have met a long lost friend. Yeah. How many years approximately does it take to, for us to incarnate? Okay, that was in the earlier uh, talks. So you have access to those talks. These, these are all uh, recordings that are live. So you can go to earlier talks. We've already spoken about that. Uh, what is the virtue we need to work out to come out of fear or obsession or compulsion? Uh, now, when you have a fear, uh, the fear that you and I normally have is because of a certain experience in our life. And because of that experience, at that, point, at that point, you actually create a thought um, and a program within you that you are now scared of this. Now, say, for example, you were riding a bike and suddenly someone hits you from behind and you have a really bad accident. And so because of what occurred, there is now a huge fear, a huge thought form in you not to go on the bike anymore. Right? So not only will you not ride the bike, you will not sit behind anybody on the bike. Even if it's an emergency, say, no, I will not. You get me a taxi or you get me an auto, but I'm not sitting on a bike. So because of an experience, you create a huge fear. Yes. Uh, and that fear becomes so strong, so overwhelming that uh, it goes beyond uh, your control at this point. But as you start to use intelligence to try and understand, so one is to understand, okay, fine, that happened. It wasn't my fault. It was actually someone else's fault. And ac accidents do happen. And if you then have the courage to say, you know what, I'm going to try one more time. If it happens again, maybe I don't. But life moves on. And so you then choose then to say, okay, fine, you know what, I'm going to try. Maybe I won't ride, I'll sit behind someone else. Right? So to slowly then go towards overcoming your fear. Uh, and the other is, if you are an, uh, a pranic healer, then you can get what is called pranic psychotherapy done to remove these thought forms and maybe the elemental or the program that you've created in it. Obsessive compulsive disorders are also in line with the same, uh, where it, it, something has happened or something has been said. And because of that experience, you then feel, for example, you need to wash your hands every time. Right? Even if you've not touched anything, you just need to wash your hands because you feel there are germs, there's, you know, there's viruses and bacteria and COVID-19 on your fingers. So you go over, over and over doing it excessively than what is already required. Yes, uh, or a compulsion to constantly check if the door is closed. You know, you close it, you, you push it like five times to check. Then again, you go down the stairs, you come back, you say, okay, let me check, right? Maybe because something happened or maybe you heard of something that happened to someone else, you created that fear because of which you need to do this action. Now, if it's not repeated, it causes stress and makes you worse. Yes, 
uh, or it is a thought that goes on repeating itself. And if you don't uh, indulge in it or don't take care of it, it becomes a problem as well. So healing is one of the ways to overcome it. It's usually because of an experience in the past. How to build clarity? What steps are needed to take uh, to be taken to overcome confusion, doubt? Uh, one of the ways to try and develop calmness, uh, one way is definitely your breathing. Yes, so when you start to breathe, um, it really helps you calm your mind and your stress levels go down. Another is also exercise. Exercise actually helps you release a lot of uh, energies, even from the emotional and the mental level, giving you a greater clarity, especially stress goes out. Uh, sometimes your irritation goes out and all those things actually block your ability to think clearly. Uh, the other is then to start to do some form of meditation. When you start to do meditation, you, you have to learn to focus. Yes, dharana, as they say. And that will then help you become aware of things around. And so the ability to enhance your clarity is development of silence or stillness at the same time awareness. Yes, I hope I'm making myself clearer. So it, when you are still, you are able to see everything, right? So you become aware of everything. But if, for example, when the water is turbulent, you cannot see the ground below. But if the water is still, you can see the ground below. Similarly, when your mind and your emotions are calm, you can see everything, you become aware of everything, both within you and sometimes without or outside of you. Yes, so work towards that slowly but steadily. Don't give up. Get angry at the wait and kick it. <laughs> yeah, I know it's not possible. You want to kick the person around you because they're trying to develop loving kindness in you or patience in you, but you can't really do that. How can we know that we've de developed or not developed? Uh, one is when you start to develop, people around you notice it and they would tell you that, you know, you've become calmer, uh, you're, you're more uh, available to others, you're easy to talk to, you're, uh, you're someone who's very open. So these things, when you start working on, people will notice and that's how you get feedback. And sometimes you know for yourself. If you're not, you can ask others. Wanted to know whether organ donation is good. <laughs> well, it really depends on, on who you are. Uh, trying to help uh, save another person and have an organ which you don't require when you leave this physical body would be great. Uh, but if you are an arhatic yogi and you're practicing regularly, uh, what happens is uh, the condition of your organ, uh, the energy condition as well, is quite different from that of uh, the host which it would go into. And sometimes it's not compatible. It may not be accepted. Yeah, But uh, giving uh, is never... Uh, something that is wrong. Yeah, you can definitely do that. So maybe when you donate, uh, hopefully the next time that organ that you come down with will be in better condition because you help someone else live through. What karma do you develop when you move from one relationship to, <laughs> well, all kinds of karma. Now, uh, the relationship, Neha, I'm presuming is not just boyfriend, girlfriend. It's relationship with, say, for example, you're a girl, you, you live with your parents and siblings. When you get married and go to another family, you still have connection with your parents and siblings. And depending on how you were with them, yeah, whether it was a loving relationship, uh, whether it was a heated relationship causing a lot of uh, fear and unhappiness, then there is karma created because of those circumstances. And so your connection with them, even if it's not very frequent this lifetime, will, will have to be dealt with next lifetime. Every, every relationship has its own good and bad aspects of karma manifesting. Yeah. What if you lose a loving spouse early in life? Uh, Bani, losing a, a spouse early in life, one is they finished with their um, journey with you which means they have something else to do after this. Now you being left behind is not easy because it's always nice to have a companion. And for you to experience that basically means that you need to learn to support yourself, develop your strengths to realize that you are strong enough to work and walk on this path by yourself. Yes, uh, because maybe in an earlier lifetime, you've been given so much support uh, that you just, you know, uh, kind of used uh, um, everyone else to kind of support yourself. But this lifetime, from that 
kind of experience to go to an experience where you learn to be by yourself and move on. Yeah. So that could be one reason. There could be others as well. You go through things, uh, sorry, you go through things of many lifetimes, not just last. Uh, well, if you're talking about things, I'm assuming you're talking about karmic balances. They do come from previous lifetimes, many, many lifetimes before it could come. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm struggling taking decisions on my career. Actually, I'm moving towards end of my PhD thesis. I face so many setbacks, blocks, and pieces uh, in my PhD even now. What should I do? All right. Um, so um, the person who's asking me this, for you to then move towards a point where you have actually worked towards completing your PhD, that's amazing, first of all. Right. Hats off to you because trying to get a doctorate uh, and, and trying to learn and understand develops your mental mind to a, low, uh, to a large extent. But that's only mental. So the people around you are also helping you develop other aspects in your personality, which needs to. And so uh, the blocks that you find, people being difficult are all ways in which they are preparing you for life ahead. Yes, not just there, because life, when you come out of, uh, you know, student life, is very, very different. The world here is very different from when you were in college or school or university. So it's preparing you for something that is yet to come. I'm assuming uh, you are young yet at this point. And so prepares you for this. Now the PhD, once you achieve that, you need to find out uh, the, the area in which you've specialized. Is it something that you still want to pursue? If you don't want to pursue it, then you need to figure out what you want to do with your life. You're still young uh, in, in my understanding. And therefore, you can choose to do something else, right? Don't worry. Whatever you learn is still going to be with you. So even if it was a PhD that you did, or yesterday someone was asking about being an architect, doesn't matter. All that goes into you to work on developing different facets of your personality or different facets of who you are today. Yeah. Okay. Aditya has mentioned the recordings. Uh, it is in your chat at 7.30 p.m. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay, five more minutes and then we'll end the session, yeah? One of my cousins has a problem in which her intracarnelia pressure is increased in the eye. It's also affected her, affected her healing is going on for the past five months. She's improving, but what would be the lesson for her or something previous life? Yes. Now, if, if you have any organ that is affected, in this case, your uh, cousin's eye, which means that um, she has either caused harm to someone else's eyes or misused her own eyes in a previous lifetime. Right. So one of the things, yes, getting healing is done is good. Uh, but what you could also do is ask her to set aside a certain amount every month to help uh, do what is called eye surgeries. It could be cataract surgeries, for example. Uh, if you like, they, uh, in the Pranic Healing Organization, the MCK's Trust Fund, we do about 2,000, uh, 2,500, I think, cataract surgeries every year and more. So you can donate there in her name so that once that's done, uh, if you're an Arhatic Yogi, you need to decree. So you see, if you want good eyes, then you need to help someone else get good eyes. That's the point, right? So getting healing is one, uh, but if you have misuse the eye, uh, either yours or somebody else's, <coughs> excuse me. But if you have helped say 20 people gain their vision back, that would slowly offset. So it's like this, your karma with reference, to your eyes is here, the negative karma. So when you do and help 20 odd people have greater vision or better vision, then the karma starts to increase still, hopefully with the healing, suddenly your eyesight becomes better. Yes. So hopefully that helps your cousin there. Uh, blood donation by Arhatics. Yes, you can, but usually I think it's better to give it to another Arhatic or to a family member who can handle your energy. If we have problems connected with an organ, uh, then can we have that organ by next lifetime? Uh, well, if an organ has been removed, hopefully your karma with that organ is already done with and next lifetime you will find that organ uh, in proper condition in your body. <laughs> not causing any more problem. If you have a question uh, for recordings, you can contact uh, Aditya. 
Vani again. I have an autistic daughter too, Sumi, uh, who is high functioning and an arhatic yogi also. Rani Healing has helped her a lot. Thank you, Master, for his teaching. I'm very happy, Vani, that the teachings of Master Cho has helped you and your autistic daughter. I wouldn't even call her autistic if she's functioning well. Good for her. Uh, all right, then. Okay, just clarifying my previous message. I feel like you, okay. Let me see if I got this right. Uh, Sing. When you go to the gym, uh, shoulder pain. So we do not get angry at the weight and kick it. Yes, uh, we do not kick the weights. Yes, uh, was only repeating my message for reference purposes because of what you said. Yes, I, um, <laughs> because I imagined. Right, no, I, I didn't misunderstand yours. I, I just thought you got it. And you, when I saw those smiley faces, I, I thought you did get it. It's, it's not that I felt uh, there was anything wrong with what you said. I think what you said was perfectly, perfectly fine. And you found the image funny, yes. Okay, so Godwin, nothing, nothing there. I, I don't think uh, I thought what you said was uh, incorrect. I, I think it's perfectly fine what you did. Okay, Radhika wants to know, Avani, if your autistic daughter is cured. If we are pranic healers in this life, does that mean that we have an opportunity to join pranic healing next? Now, next lifetime, you know, you might come here after many, many years. I'm not sure if pranic healing will still be there. There might be other healing modalities that are there. But if you have an inclination towards healing, whatever modality there. Uh, strikes you or is similar with your vibration is what you will be attracted to. Uh, it may not necessarily be uh, what we call prana healing today. It might have a different, uh, uh, different name. How many years approximately does it take to reincarnation? Okay, again, uh, I think it was either in yesterday's or day before yesterday's, uh, yesterday's reincarnation was all, all yesterday. You can look at yesterday's recording. If I have a question to watch the recording, uh, Aditya, please help uh, Banumati, please. That is 741 again. If you've got the answer already, Banumati, I'm just looking at it right now. How long will it be available? I'm not too sure. We'll have to check and see uh, because, you know, each of these recordings are rather large. We'll have to see how much uh, they're giving us at this point. Yeah. Okay, people, I think we're more or less done. Uh, Vani says, my daughter is improving a lot with pranic healing. Yeah, so that's your answer there. Thank you, uh, everyone. So uh, is the word essence same as force without matter? Uh, essence is what they refer to in the book as uh, spirit. Yes, so we're talking about the spirit in matter. All right, people, with that, we come to the end. Thank you for being with us. I hope the uh, teachings were simple enough for you. Kindly close your eyes. Inhale and exhale, relax the body. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother. To our beloved and respected teacher, Grandmaster Master Chalkok, sweet to Lord Mahagaraji Mailing. To all the great ones, to all the great teachers, the great beings of knowledge, light and power, to our soul and divine self. We thank you all for your great, great blessings, for your light, for your love, for your mercy, for your guidance and divine protection. We especially thank you for the priceless teachings. We ask you to help us to absorb and assimilate this deeply, properly and effectively so we may become better divine instruments to do your work. We thank you in full faith. Inhale and exhale, absorb all the energy coming to you. You may slowly open your eyes with a smile. Atma Namaste, everybody. Thank you for being with us. And that comes, uh, that with that, we come to the end of uh, the session. We'll meet you tomorrow at 6.30. Thank you, Sumi. And you're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sumi. You're most welcome. Okay, so tomorrow's topic is the planetary chains. Tomorrow we'll do planetary chains. Yeah? Good night. Bye. Good night. Namaste, everyone.